Hello there, everybody, and I am here with Adam Terrell of Third Window Films. Adam, I'm so thankful that you're doing this. Third Window has been uh, special for me for a long time, so thank you for taking the time to, to step in and talk about you guys. Thanks for having me on and for uh, loving uh, or liking, at least, uh, the, the label. <laughs> uh, Third Window Films has done a lot over the years. Um, first of all, you guys have been around a lot longer than people think. You were... What are we at? Like 16, 17 years, something like that? I started in 2000. I started acquiring in 2005. But um, right. when I, my first release was uh, 2007. So, yes, I've been releasing for more than 15 years, but around for uh, 17. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, when I did there, it was the 15th anniversary of the first release a few weeks ago. And I, yeah, I really forgot. And when I, looking back at it, it was quite <laughs> nostalgic. But um, yeah, it has been a long time. And not only has uh, you know the industry seen a lot of changes, the the trends of releases seen a lot of changes, but you personally, I'm sure, have seen a lot of changes in the last 15 years. Uh, you recently just moved, and now now you're in Japan, correct? Actually, I've been in Japan since uh, for about uh, nearly 10 years. Uh, wow! I moved over to work on uh, a film called The Land of Hope, a Shion Sono film, and since that allowed me to sort of get a, a visa and get a a foothold here and for the first few years i was half and half but uh right. probably for the last seven eight years i've been here full time um and i don't think i could go back uh to england or europe to be honest that's fantastic i mean if you love it that much i i'm certainly jealous i i've wanted to make my way out there for quite some time and i've got young kids which makes it uh a couple of people will think that makes it like twice as difficult it's actually like 10 times as difficult <laughs> um the the stuff that you guys put out is there a is there like a definition of what you try to say third window films tries to distribute to the world uh, basically i've been just trying to release films that aren't getting released uh, for one reason or another mainly because they're probably not that commercial or they're <laughs> not that popular and uh right you know there's a lot of japanese films i think people really don't truly understand how many films are made here each year for for uh a country of which films don't go overseas. Uh, there's about 600 films made every year and only really like a small handful of them get overseas. So um, there's a lot, I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of crap, uh, uh, but there's a lot of crap everywhere. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, American independent cinema has uh, its pitfalls as well. But, uh, you know, I just try to do my best about uh, getting as many films that I like and, and aren't getting the, the light of day and get, getting them out there. Uh, am I right in remembering that Third Window is pretty much all you? Yes, and, and that's the only way that I've been able to do what, I've, what I'm able to do. <laughs> I think uh, if I had staff and an office and all that, then, you know, there'd be these overheads and then you have to start thinking, you know, in a business-minded sense. And uh, I'm not terribly business-minded and I, I'm awful at delegating. So maybe it just became me because I'm quite stubborn in that way. But it also, I think, helps with being able to get these tiny... Japanese films out there and also being able to speak Japanese and do a lot of the, the work uh, behind the scenes like the subtitling and the shooting the bonus features myself and editing and, and doing all the, the lay, lay, layouts for the artwork and all that and over the years it's become yes uh, just just well, it always was me but initially I used to outsource uh, some jobs and now I try to do everything as much as possible by myself in, uh, in my little Tokyo apartment. That is beyond impressive I mean the amount of work that it takes to do some of these uh, especially in the last year, you guys have, it seems like, made an effort to put out some, some, I hate to use the word bigger titles, but they're more, they're more like mainstream to capture so, some new viewers, it appears. And, uh, I mean, the, the effort that something, I was going to talk about this one later, but something like this that you guys put out, that, that has to take a lot from you. Yeah, but that's not really getting any new viewers, to be honest. I mean, those, uh, that's, that's more of a passion project, uh, because I really wanted to help the director because he's had, uh, so many troubles in the past uh right. japan is uh, quite strict on uh, any criminal offensive offenses and their idea of a criminal offense is quite uh stricter uh, than uh, maybe western so yeah. he's had some problems with like tiny amounts of marijuana in the past or something that's, that's had him blacklisted and uh, i've always liked him as a person as a filmmaker so i put the extra effort in to promote him and to keep his name alive because you know i think without having films out on a physical format there is, even if they're only selling small amounts, there's, you know, in 10 years time, will that have, it's like if a tree falls in the, in the woods, you know, right. you know if it isn't out there in a lot and in people's hands, then 
in 10 years time it could be forgotten and that's the same for, for directors if their work is not out there in people's hands in people's houses whether or not they constantly watch them or not you know i think it's for the sake of the future it's really important so the toyota's things were more just a uh, uh yes a passion of, of uh, love and you know all the hours put into it wasn't that hard because i'm quite friends with him so i go to his we, we go, he comes to my house and we just we put my computer on and we just record the audio commentary into, into my, my computer as it is. So it's uh, obviously the subtitling a lot takes time, but you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, just to help him out uh, as much as possible. That's still, uh, it's, it, you're obviously speaking with a lot of humility, but it's still a lot of work. And uh, one of the things that I try to do on my channel and the way that I am discussing with these people that are into this hobby is really break down how much work these are because a lot of people take them for granted and one of the biggest complaints nowadays is pricing especially you know the the entire world we're in the middle of a giant inflation surge over the last couple of years uh people are out of work people are i mean people are literally dying across the globe and so yes physical media is low on the priority list in the grand scheme of those things but uh if you are going to take the time to appreciate these things it's important to know what goes into them and the people behind them so that's the main reason I wanted to have you on here today, so people could see the face behind Third Window and perhaps uh, feel more of the the tug on the heartstring to dive more into Japanese cinema. So, um, first of all, again, thank you for all of these releases. Uh, the first one I wanted to highlight, because I feel like this is what brought a lot of people to you guys for the first time, is uh, One Cut of the Dead. I think you had a huge hand in this, right? Well, I think that's... Yes, it was such a successful hit, but that had a lot of work that I put into it personally. Right. Um, that was a film that I took on way before it was released in Japan. And I I loved that film so much. I mean, it, when I'm looking for a film to distribute, you know, if that film has not become popular through film festivals, through uh, international media and this and that, then it becomes very hard to actually distribute the film. For example, if a, a film I've got, I had I distributed recently called Zoki, it didn't play any film festivals because the sales agent weren't so good about it getting into film festivals. And therefore, when it's released, it had no fanfare and nobody wanted to pick it up. Right. So I'm always nervous that, you know, if I leave it all up to these sales agents, these producers, then it's no point me distributing it because they're going to screw it up one way or another. The Japanese are very good at the international. Uh, right. So what I did is in, in the cases of, of One Color of the Dead and many other films like Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes is if it's a film I want to distribute, I'd go to them the very beginning and said, look, let me bring your film worldwide and act as a sales agent, put it into film festivals, you know, we'll, um, make the, the correct artwork so it's going to be popular and get picked up and, and do everything, everything required to get that film out there. Then bring it all around the world for a year or two, sell it to other film, other distributors right. as well, and then distribute it myself so that all the work I put into it also comes back to me in that respect. And one kind of the dead yeah, was was one that I, I I brought to like 150 film festivals and also in order to keep the cost down for the for the um producer well he made a lot of money in the end anyway but uh, like only had like three DCPs over 150 right. film festivals so like every cost bring all the cost of subtitling I'll do that you know um let's not make any expensive DCPs you know if it's if you if you give it to a big company to handle it's like well, we have to go to Cannes and we have to market it there. And that's going to cost right. you like $20,000 because of our hotel. And then we're going to go to this festival and this festival. And then we're going to we need like 100 DCPs and like 300 posters and all that. And it's like, no, no, no. Let's cut all those costs off. And I'm just going to just put the time and effort in and get that film to 150 film festivals without costing anything. So it's all profit uh, as well. So, yeah, I, I really put a lot of effort in. Of course, it's a fantastic film. But there are many fantastic films out there that don't get out there because of the, the, the sales agents um, wanting right. too much money for it or something. I mean, there are so many examples of, of Asian films that, that should be more well-known and aren't because the companies that handle them are a bit uh, of a pain. So, um, yes, One Cut was one that uh, I think, yes, really did help my company um, get, out, get out there. But it, it was, uh, you know, years, years of work as well. Well, it, it shows. And that release is special not only just for the film itself but everything that is on that disc the the packaging of it 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 was quite obvious that it was somebody that had this as a passion project so again uh just everything is evident that when you are putting your mind to it these they, they can be incredible and i just hats off to you for one person being able to produce all of this is is astonishing and i'm i'm curious because if i remember right most uh, probably not most but a lot of the films on the label 
they're not available literally anywhere else, right? Yeah, in many cases, uh, it's the only release. Even, for example, with the Toshi to to uh, Toshiaki Toyota film, some of them are not even available in Japan. Right. I mean, uh, recently, Funky Forest and Warped Forest. Warped Forest was never released in any format, it, it, not even in cinemas in Japan. So it was the first time the film was ever released outside of a film festival. And uh, I mean, I also think that because these films have such a limited audience, that if it isn't the only release of the film out there, then I don't think uh, it'll be... You know it'll sell enough to break even and even right. in those cases for example i mean you mentioned the, the fact that um of course you know there's so many blu ray release companies out there and there's only so much money that these people have but how right. many copies it does take to break even on, on on how many copies sold it takes to break even on these releases and you know for example if a film like crazy thunder road which is uh was the only release of the film in 40 years outside of japan and it hasn't even sold 1,000 copies, which is the break-even point. So, you know, and that's that's not so expensive. I mean, if, if you're paying like 13, 14 pounds to buy the disc, the only version of, and with loads of exclusive extras as well, and yet that that hasn't broken even. So, um, you know, I think I, we, I try to bring the price down as much as I can, but, you know, a lot of these titles don't even break even. And that is, uh, that's why I need films like One Cut of the Dead and Hero of the Goblin and the, the, the obvious titles to balance those, those others yeah, yeah. so uh, for if you're open to to sharing is 1000 usually about the break-even point for most titles yes i mean uh usually if you want to pay any sort of uh guarantee which is required to usually right. license the films then you could leave the cost of breaking even on for example the blu-ray authoring the manufacturing of a thousand units the um certification cost by the bbfc and all that you're talking about 600 units or 500 units and then you have the the a price you have to pay to acquire the film on top of that and yes it takes about a thousand a thousand copies to um break even uh, and uh, it's it's hard to sell a thousand copies uh, nowadays to be honest that uh that hurts um w with some of your obviously like one cut of the dead is a bigger title with some of the smaller titles uh how uh well like i wasn't going to bring this one up yet but ruined heart i just watched this for the first time the other night and this movie First of all, it's a beautiful movie. This is such an astonishing release. Uh, not sure your history with this one. I've not gotten to any of the extras on it other than the music is incredible. It is shot magnificently. But I don't feel like anybody's talking about this film. So if you can, how, how many have, have you sold A Ruined Heart? That just sold its its thousands copy. Wow. It, only 1,000 were made. And we're talking about, uh, I don't know, six years ago. Right. So it, it took about six years to sell, sell them through. Just 1,000 copies. Uh, uh, but that's an experimental film, and I really can't expect Very. Um, people, unless you're really into experimental cinema, uh, I don't think it's, it's easy you want to get into. But it's a, it's a very uh, interesting release with a nice booklet, uh, the soundtrack yeah. CD. And, you know, for, for people that want to try something, who have want to try something a little experimental with, with like those sales points of Asano Tabnobu, Christopher Doyle, uh, music yeah. by Stereo Total, I mean, it's an interesting package, but yes, it, it's a bit of a hard one to, to recommend. I mean, that came about by um, a company called Rapid Eye Movies, who are a, a German distributor of Asian and uh, cult cinema who've been around for about 20 years or, or more. And they were a company that I used to love before I got into distribution, and I really respected them. And that, the owner of that company, a guy called Stefan Hall, went into film production, uh, first with a film called Underwater Love, which I released. And right. recently and afterwards with Ruin Heart and a few others. And I always wanted to support him because he's also in a lot of uh, trouble as a distributor and going into production as well makes things even harder. So of course. in those releases, uh, I just wanted to help him, uh, Underwater Love and Ruin Heart and the Pink Films as well were, were projects of his. And uh, yes, they, they were, he, he bought a film scanner and he tried to scan all these old Pink Films, but the costs were too expensive. So I was right. like, okay, I'll help you distribute them and pay you money to cover your costs and uh, just to help him keep keep going with what he loves because I love him as a, as a person and I love, respect his company. So yeah, it's um, it, it's hard for, for everyone who tries to do these sort of uh, non-mainstream right. films, I think. Well, I hope the uh, the overall karma of you trying to share that has, has come back to you many times over because some of these, again, I, I fear that no one would get to see some of these because they would never, literally never get a release. Um, so something like Ruined Heart, obviously, 
has a lower audience and it just got to a thousand over six years uh but some of these other like the uh the toyota box sets have those done fairly well for you the first box set i made 2000 and they literally just sold out over the last year and that was um right. yeah that was about took about five six years uh, uh and that wasn't they were all region releases of, of three films that had never been released uh uh nine souls have been released on dvd uh, before but uh they were the first blu-ray releases in the world not even in, J in japan were they wow. um and that took uh Yes, um, about six years to sell 2,000 and at a much cheaper price point than the new box set because of the fact that over, through COVID, a lot of the costs for manufacturing and uh, everything else have gone up, uh, which is why I've had to release so many more mainstream films over the last right. couple of years because it's really, really, really gotten a lot harder. So the, the new Toyota box set had a much higher price point, but, but more films. And, and in total, it's sold about 800 copies so far. But I had to press 2,000 because the, the cost of pressing just 1,000 makes the, the per, per unit cost uh, way too right. much. So um, I've still got, yeah, 1,000 copies uh, <laughs> in boxes. Well, I hope this uh, inspires at least some people to, to check them out because a lot of these are just beautiful, touching movies. And they are quite obvious. Somebody's like life's work encapsulated in one film in many of these instances. And that is... It's so hard to see nowadays because, uh, especially with people that are just into Western cinema and they're, you know, overridden with studio watered down trash, basically. Not to not to put those down too much, but a lot of the the culture that you can find in these, you you can't really pay for an experience like that unless you're going to do something like this. And it's astonishing what you've been able to release. Well, uh, just luckily, especially being in Japan, has allowed me to work directly with with um right. directors and producers without needing to go through studios which make things more expensive and more complicated Je dealing with japanese companies in general is, is very hard for westerners because it's a complete opposite uh, way of working and because japan is such an island nation you know i'm from england which is an island nation of course but it's very different in the fact that japan everything is domestic and and right. all the films make their money back in Japan, so they don't think about the international market, and they don't really understand the international market. So, for me to go to them and explain to them, you know, the, your costs that you're asking for are completely different to what the actual market is. They just don't understand that because they're they're, they're disconnected from it. So, right. working with those those studios makes things uh, yes very stressful. So, luckily being here and speaking Japanese, I can go to people like Toyota directly, and sometimes he can push the studios on my behalf to um. Help me! Uh, it helped me with the uh, with Ishikatsu Hito for films like uh, Funky Forest and all that. Like having something that's being close to directors or producers, they can give the studios a push if required, and uh, right. it does help things. So it gives me a lot of side advantage. But then again, you know, if there were more people interested in buying these films, then it would be completely different. But there's less people interested in, as in sales agents or distributors buying these films because the audience is obviously not there. So it's uh, right. it's I don't know. If, I wouldn't say it's pointless, but um. Yes, it's, it's, it's a, bit, a bit niche. On on that note, uh, and this is maybe going to sound like a, an ignorant Westerner type of question to ask, but with the ultra rise in Hong Kong cinema getting more uh, attention lately, with some of the, the Korean cinema getting more attention lately, with Asian cinema just getting a lot of love from a lot of labels, is there any, like paying attention to Japanese cinema rising that you feel like people are seeking it out more in any sense of that? I think, you know, the, the success of a lot of the Korean um, popular titles of the last few years, or if you look at things like Squid Game or Parasite, they're a little more alternative or a little more uh, uh, genre. Yeah. And also, you know, the I think the Korean and, and uh, Hong Kong audience uh, producers and, and uh, probably they're, they're used to making those sorts of films and promoting them because they know that that sells well. Right. But as I mentioned, Japan is very insular and, and films like that are making it obviously is like Drive My Car, which is actually sort of a foreign film in, es in essence because all the people behind it are, are foreign. Is um, yeah, it's it's maybe if people are watching that, they're not going to want to watch a film like One Cut of the Dead because it's uh, it's <laughs> it's completely different genre. Right. While Parasite maybe brings you into more sort of uh, fantastic type titles and the, the the type of Japanese films that have traditionally been popular, with the exception of Asia Extreme, uh, it has been like Ozu and Kurosawa, and those right. are the films that um maybe people that don't watch Japanese cinema would want to watch. Uh, 
you have the, obviously the, the 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 battle royale fans of which there are many of them but they don't make those films in japan to be honest i mean i think a right. lot of the films that were popular overseas um the, were just not popular in japan and therefore they, they don't make them like uh Shion Sono, the Sushi Typhoon type films of like, you know, Hell Driver and uh, Machine Girl and all that. Those are films right. aimed at a sort of international audience, but but they're not popular in Japan. So it's a catch-22. It's like, you know, if you make a film for the international audience and it doesn't do well, then you're in trouble. But if you make a film for the Japanese audience, then you have a very much better chance of, of uh, it making money. So they mainly right. focus on, on that side. That makes sense. And uh, making money, this is... This is probably one of the first times that I uh, noticed Third Window Films in more of an empathetic way last year. And I'm not sure if you remember. I'm sure you do because it, it clearly affected you. But uh, you posted across social media that the there was a film that you guys released that when you Googled it, the entire first page of results was for bootlegs and torrents. Um, there are a lot of people still naive to the fact of how that can affect people. So considering that a lot of these, the only official release is through Third Window Films, can you share how something like that can literally like destroy one of these labels? And it's also actually not just the, uh, destroying the labels, which it obviously does because, you know, people aren't buying it, they're, they're downloading it illegally. But it's right. the reason also why Japanese companies don't sell their films um, to the international market, because they know that if a distributor takes it on, it's immediately going to be pirated. And Japan is very different to the rest of the world because piracy is not an issue in Japan. Um, you know, I think Korea piracy and, and a lot of other parts of Asia, obviously China and, and Hong right. Kong, Korea, piracy is a big problem for them. So they also understand that it's a problem for everyone else. And they just basically try to get things out at the same time to beat piracy in that respect. But right. the Japanese, because as, as I mentioned before, um, Japanese are so strict on criminals. I mean, to the fact that I remember hearing a story that um, a kid had downloaded one film just one film. And the police went and broke down his, his, his doors and put him in jail for one film. And they, they do that in the same way that Toyota the, is, is arrested for like half a gram of or, or some whatever tiny amount of marijuana is right. to make sure that people don't commit crimes. I mean, 19, Japan is quite famous for having a 99% conviction rate. Is They make examples a lot so that people don't right. don't make crimes. So therefore, they think that um, if a film that they give to a distributor or allow a distributor to take, it's immediately going to get pirated and therefore it's going to hurt them. So they just said, all right, we're just not going to sell our films unless it's a big enough amount of money that it makes it worthwhile for us. And But those that a massive amounts of money is, is something that distributors like myself, because we, we have trouble with piracy, cannot afford to pay. So it's a sort of complicated situation for everyone. But yes, piracy is... Uh, it's uh, yes, it kills everyone, but it kills smaller distributors who have lots less margins more than it kills like, uh, you know, Hollywood, I guess, because right. Hollywood is still having, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people watching their films in cinemas. And if I'm only selling like 500 Blu-rays and, you know, if, if I lose a couple hundred of that, then that's, that's half, a bit deal. half the sales. Yes. It's, oh, that's depressing. Um, I, w when you posted that last year, I, I, I have a weekly live show, and that was a good 10 or 15 minutes of discussion on how supporting some of these smaller labels not only leads to success for that label, but literally to the hobby as a whole. It encourages others to, to participate, to watch, to ensure that we're archiving film and art in, in general. And I, I, I don't know, I feel like there are still millions of people that don't think it's a problem anymore and the fact that in 2021 you had to come out and post and say look i just put out this film and this is the only thing that you can find on the internet right now it is it's so debilitating well it's right it's i think a lot of people also misread what i was saying uh I, there were a lot of people saying well we google searched it and it wasn't the pirate sites but right. what i was what i should have probably been a little more clear is that when i release a film i usually search for the last week or two of yes. uh, hits on Google because that's the, the things that would be related to the release and yeah. they were yes all all pirate uh, sites and but yes as you mentioned I think people don't really even my mother my mother who, who knows her son <laughs> runs a film company is like oh I'll just download that later and it's like don't just don't don't tell me that you know like uh, <laughs> you know, this is why we're living like you know it's it doesn't occur to her that, that that's a problem and and I think many right. people in the world just don't think of it as a problem and. and but then again, you know, you in this world nowadays where like, you know, you pay five dollars a month and you get like access to like thousands of films, you know, 
that a film itself has become less valuable. Correct. You know, living in Japan really makes you see the world from a different standpoint because it's a world where video on demand is not popular here yet, where people go to the cinema and the cinema prices don't have matinee prices. In fact, they've gone up over the last uh, couple of years. So it's all, there's no dollar cinemas or things like that as yeah. they do in the States. And it's like, you pay to see the movie, you sit through the movie to the very end of the credits to give respect to the people that have made that movie. And, you know, if you like it, you can go and rent it from, from a video store and uh, watch it again. But, you know, it's, it's, it's about, yes, paying and, and supporting because if, if something gets cheaper and cheaper, the price can't go back up afterwards. Right. And therefore, something becomes less and less valuable the more the, the, the cheaper it is uh, marketed as. And um, we unfortunately live in this, uh, well, luckily for movie watchers who can watch anything for, for pay $5 a month and have watched like thousands of films. But yes, it makes it a lot harder to uh, continue making films. And um, I think if you, I can't expect everyone to go and spend like 15 pounds on, on, on a DVD right. or Blu-ray or, you know, it's or just blind buy something just to support. So, but, um, you know, I think in general, you know, if people can understand that the amount of work, effort, uh, time that goes into getting out these things, you don't have to buy this one, but at least in general, try to um, support things. I mean, you wouldn't go to a shop and go, oh, that Coca-Cola looks nice. I'm just going to steal it, would you? Right. But you, at the same time, you're like, oh, I want to watch this movie. I'm just going to download it. And, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, you, you're, you're in essence stealing for something that, that people have made. And, uh, you know, it's a lot, it hurts a lot more when that Coca-Cola is like the Adam's Coca-Cola and it's only like 100 right. made, you know. I mean, <laughs> that's a good point um well speaking of getting people to support uh you've already announced some titles coming out the rest of the year and uh they they seem to be some that people are really after so do you mind sharing any info on uh suicide club suicide club has some has some problems um it was supposed to have been released and i was obviously the shion sono situation has come up and um all the people that were connected to helping put out the release as in making new audio commentaries unfortunately that film never had any good had any bonus features from the original right. japanese release and you can't just release a um uh, a bare bones disc nowadays you need to obviously have make it a collectibles item and uh, i have somebody making very nice artwork for it or some illustrators artwork and i had um lots of bonus features all set up and everybody just pulled out of it after the accusations right and I tried to renegotiate with the sales agent to, to allow me to, and also the video on demand co company that was supposed to buy it dropped out as well. So I tried to renegotiate to bring the price down to make it worthwhile and they, they wouldn't let me. So I had to, it's just sort of on hold. Like I haven't paid for it because I can't afford the amount there there without having to pre-sell it to some, right. some VOD companies. So yeah, it's a bit on the, the back burner. I mean, I think people have forgotten about this, the Sono thing because like, at the time, everybody was saying we're not going to support a film, a Sion Sono film, and now loads of people are mailing me and said, "When's the next? When's the release of Su right. Suicide Club?" So I, I don't know. It's if if everyone, you know, to, to be honest, I know Sion Sono personally, and I don't think the accusations or he's been pictured in the light that is 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 really just to, to what he, who he is as a person. Um, I think he's been a little uh, uh, scapegoated. Um, in a very heated uh, situation, but I can't really say that he's an angel either. So um, it's a bit complicated. And, and uh, yeah, that release is, uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's I get that. Uh, what about the Obiashi stuff that's supposed to be coming? Yeah, that, that's a, a big uh, release, um, a box set uh, as, as the previous Obayashi box set, but with films that are a lot more accessible. Um, right. They're not all three hours long. And that has obviously helped <laughs> a lot in, in making uh, bonus features and checking the subtitles and, and doing everything else because right. uh yeah so i'm making just finally up finalizing up some audio commentaries right now and uh i've got the artwork just finished by the same person who did the last artwork and uh yeah hopefully i'll have some news within the next by the end of august or something uh of release date but um yeah it'll be uh those those are four fantastic films they're all quite different in their own way and they're uh, never been released outside of japan before so Wow. I think it, it should be, or I hope it will. It's a popular set. I've uh, I've already had multiple people ask me about that since we posted about that earlier this year when you uh, announced that that was coming. So I I know that there are people already looking out for it. Yes, and they're all going to say, "Why is it lottery to be?" And uh, you know, I, I don't think also people realize that 
it's not our, it's not we're not the bad guys you know it's not right. our fault and and uh, speaking also as a producer from the other side as in from the perspective of the people that are selling the film to distributors if you allow somebody to make it all region unless they're paying a huge amount of money for it it's very complicated it means that you can only sell it to in essence one distributor and if you're a producer or something and making a, a film you need as many distributors to buy the film so that you can make as much money as you can to recoup any sort of costs. I mean, obviously these are old films, so there's no cost in that sense, but uh, you know, it's not easy to just like make it region free and make it available to everyone. It's, it's so it's not our fault. Uh, and of course I'd love to make it region free because then it can increase my sales, but I have contract that says I can't. And uh, if I do, I'm in breach of a contract. And uh, you know, it's a lot harder for distributors to make a film region free than like a, a, a user just buying a region free player. And I always say that you don't need to buy an, a, a player sold as region free. There are many players that you can buy on Amazon in Black Friday for like $30 that uh, can be made region free very simply with a, just yeah. a remote control hack. And every time I get a mail, I, I copy and paste the same reply to each one just to go to this website and, and, and get a region free player that a player that can be made region free. I, uh, I also suggest for people just go to like a uh, amazon.co.uk and get a region B player. So you can always have one connected and now you got the best of both worlds. But that's more complicated because that, that requires a voltage adapter. Right. And, uh, I think people would just, just, I, I'll tell you like, uh, I, when I lived, I lived in the States for a while and I got some Toshiba $40 player and before I bought it, I went on dvdhacks.com and I found a player that, uh, right. That you can re press two buttons on the remote control and it's region free. I mean, it's uh, it's not not too complicated. It's not like you have to mod chip something like you used to. Uh, I still have people ask things like, "Is Third Window Films is their stuff region free?" And I I think that there are still too many people that think the labels get to decide if things are region locked. Um, can you share some of the process behind that since you've worked on both sides? Well, as I as I just mentioned, you know, I think. Uh, you know, we have contracts with these, these sales agents and the contracts stipulate we can sell within our territory, which is a territory that has is, been described as locked to a certain region. Right. So, for example, region A is America and it's English and region B is Europe. And then obviously there's the, the, the language that can be used on the disc as well. Right. And if I were where I want to have because I'm an English language have English subtitles, if I were to make mine region A, it then ends end, end up therefore being available in the States and therefore they can't sell that film to the States. And were I to pay a, a large amount of money, I could, I could buy both regions, but um, I can't. Sometimes with very small films, you can negotiate. And I do have some films that are, are region free because I've said, if I'm the only person that's going to release this film in the world, then look, let me just take all regions and then I'll, I'll it'll increase the sales and therefore I can give you a better royalty based on sales. But if it's a popular title, then I think it's, uh, it's, it's impossible. I mean, I know nowadays, you know, with, with 4k and all that or, or UHD, uh, they're, they're, they're made up as region, region free or something, but, um, the costs, uh, as you know, you can't put a 4k out of a Japanese, like small independent right. film. It's pointless. <laughs> you can't put a 4k of ruined heart out there. <laughs> It's only shot in 2K, so yes, I think also people forget like, uh, you yeah. know, you when I, when I went to these Japanese films, it's like shot on 16 millimeters. It's like you can't put that out in 4K because it's you can't blow up 16 millimeter to 4K or like you're talking about like films that have budgets of like, like, I don't know, 50,000 or 100,000 dollars. And it's like it's going to look worse in 4K because right. then the budgetary constraints and the lack of uh, proper lighting used in filming is going to look awful like uh, people yeah get so caught up in these things that are set by massive of course you want to watch avatar in 4k but it doesn't mean that you can put like uh ruined heart in 4k right and not to mention uh the, even if you really wanted to try the restoration price on that would almost be probably the budget of the entire film yes and also the, you know japanese aren't very willing to uh restore in 4k and and they don't like their prints to leave japan either in order for a, a foreign company to, to do that as well so but in the end, you know, if it's Battle Royale, then, then you can put in 4K because you know people are going to buy it. But uh, right. you can't put all the costs into uh, some small Japanese films that are barely selling a thousand copies. I mean, if I had done Crazy Thunder Road in 4K or something, I'd be in big trouble right now. Uh, on, the, on the monetary note, if you could share, um, I've heard some behind the scenes rumors that the price 
essentially to license a Japanese film in region B is exponentially less than to license it to region A. For sure. For sure. I mean, because region A is America. And America is, is you know, how many, five, six times the population of, of the UK. Right. And when you have more people, then you have a bigger audience to, to sell to. And therefore, the price is, you know, represents that. But it still doesn't actually represent it. It's not like an American region A is like five times, six times more. Actually, it's only a little bit more or maybe double right. the price for, uh, for UK, which makes it even harder as a UK distributor because, because we're English, uh, because we're English, because we, we um, release films in English, right. the sales agents also know that it opens up the market um, to Europe because a lot of people in France or Germany can speak English, would buy discs from England, where if it's a French release with French only subtitles, you're basically limited to maybe to France only. Right. So the costs are very high for such a small population just because of the, the language. Uh, hmm. So it's 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 it's, very, it's a lot harder to release a film as an English distributor than an American distributor, I believe, because it just doesn't really work out uh, percentage wise. That makes sense. Uh, that was uh, the monetary side of things. So to get into the person behind Third Window, who who is Adam? How'd you get where where you are? Uh, you mentioned living in the states, living in the UK, living in Japan. You've had a you've had a busy life. Yeah, I moved to the States when I was 10. My mother won a green card. They used to have a lottery that could give you American green cards. And we, we won it and, and moved to the States. And uh, I moved, we moved to Florida, of all places. Uh, not the most uh, cultural. Right. <laughs> so, but I ended up working. At, there was a video store in, in Florida called Video Renaissance, um, which was, if it wasn't in Florida, it would be world famous. Uh, they had about 50,000 <laughs> films 50,000 can you imagine right. uh, of, of the owner had been buying every single film in every format since the 80s and just wow. never thrown away anything so any out of print you know things like films like fear anxiety and depression the Todd Haynes like debut film like all that stuff was like on VHS that it was basically an archive that was stuck in this like very small town called Sarasota in Florida and uh, you know it was uh, it was a pity that um you know, it was in a place like that because if it was in New York. I mean, people would come from all over. Right. And I, I worked there for years. And, and that's where I sort of understood the concept of, of distribution because, you know, just watching and buying every film we could as a shop. But then again, not being able to see so many films because they weren't distributed. Uh, right. You know, so uh, that really got me into distribution and, and also being able to. Uh, about Asi Asian cinema, um, you know, at the time it was like we would, uh, I would trade with Video Search of Miami, who was a, um, a VHS, like, uh, you, they were saying these big handwritten catalogs and you, would, you wouldn't know what anything is because right. it's just a catalog with words and you just say, well, that sounds good and you <laughs> post them a letter back and uh, they would send you like centipede horror because, and then you watch like fifth generation VHS and, uh, you know, they, they got me so much into the like, uh, obscure Asian cinema and, uh, I moved back to England when I was 20, and uh, at the time, Tartan Films was uh, was quite popular with its Asia Extreme brand, and I interned there for, for uh, a year or so, and um, I realized that, you know, from the outside, companies like that seem fantastic, but when you work in companies, you know, you realize that, you know, you think that everyone there is going to be big fans of cinema and Asia right. cinema and, like, know everything, but then it's not really the case, and I think it's, it's a bit disillusioning, and I stopped then, and... and um, and started third window films. That is a heck of a journey, and I think that there are a lot of people that have uh, obviously not the same ending necessarily, but a lot of the people that are in this hobby, their passion started with memories like walking through a video rental store, or uh, you know their parents' collection of laser discs or something like that. And it is uh, to me, it feels like we are in essentially the true modern golden age of physical media. Would you agree with that? Hmm. I don't know. I think that there has in, been a in this generation, at least. Yeah. I mean, we're lucky because it has become cool, but not like, for example, records became, you know, popular again, uh, right. over the last few years. And, and that, ha you know, after so many years of, of, uh, of, of digital really, becoming the, ma the mainstream, you know, it became popular again to, right. to um, uh, buy records or collect books or buy books, you know, or, 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 or <laughs> Blu-rays or DVDs. But 
if you re I wonder if it really is the golden age because if you think of if it was so popular then there'd be loads of record shops video shops rental shops and and things on the high street and uh, or retailers online but there isn't really that many and you know I when I when I look back at um you know when I first started off or even during the first few years I was speaking yesterday to um my friend uh, Joey at uh, Terracotta Distribution, and he would release a film and like sell like 3,000 copies in the first week. And I would have titles that would sell like even tiny Japanese films that would sell thousands and thousands of copies. And nowadays, I can have a major Japanese film barely selling a thousand copies. So I wonder if it's, uh, I mean, of course, it's become a little cooler now. And the, 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 the collector's market has become uh, uh, maybe stronger, but it's, it's really only a few companies that are, that are doing it and there aren't really that many films getting out there compared to what they used to be. But, right. but Blu-ray is, is, is actually expensive. You know, DVD was, I think DVD was really the best market because, and it was cheap to make it and there was just so many films getting out there. So um, it's changed, but I, I don't know. I think DVD at its heyday was, was much, uh, much better for film lovers uh, because, you know, not format lovers. I think right. well, that's the difference nowadays is, uh, Everybody's buying them, but I wonder how many people are actually watching the films and how many are watching the the, the the bonus features on disc. I think they like to say that they've got these films and they've got these bonus features, but I feel that DVD was a time where people would actually watch the films a lot more. That is a probably very true statement, and which is why I tried to really cultivate the 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 sort of community of people to actually discuss what they think of these films and how it affected them and. I don't know. Uh, the when I when I mentioned the golden age, I'm really thinking in more of a, a post streaming world, um, and it seems like this is. I'm not going to say it's going to be on its way down, but it seems like through COVID, everything got really strong for a good year and a half or so, and now that that heat seems to be coming off a little bit again. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, think I think uh, thanks to companies like Arrow Films who really have right. cultivated a, a strong audience, and 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 yes, I think. Uh, there was a lot of feeling from people too, and there has been a lot of feeling over the past few years of supporting of independent films doing better than, than um, Hollywood films, um, mm -hmm. and that sort of want to support, uh, you know, your, your local DIY records store and uh, your your local coffee shop, and uh, I think the whole independence has become popular. Uh, I mean, if you walk down any main street of a of a, a major city nowadays, it's all like shops made to look. Or, or like like they've been run by a family, uh, yeah. you know, which is um, sort of brings it back to yes, the concept of sort of independent film distribution. It's uh, that DIY record label type uh, feeling to it. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I think yeah, I don't know. I think it's it maybe works more of a, as a theory than than <laughs> I, I really wonder sometimes, um, you know, how well. But yeah, I, you know, I think Arrow, come, Arrow and some companies like that. And, and there have been lots of new distributors, um, surprisingly. I, I wouldn't have thought there'd be so many new distributors popping up. Like um, there's Aero 4444 and Comedian Films in, in Australia and, uh, and um, uh, Radiance uh, popping up now. But I'm always surprised that like some of these companies release like one, two films and people on the internet saying like, this is my new favorite label. And it's like, well, right. you know, some companies have been working for, for, for many more years and it, it's releasing two films, uh, maybe it's consistent, you get 100% uh, with two good films, but uh, try right. that over 15 years. Well, that is a, a really good time to ask. Uh, some of these older titles that you put out maybe you know five or six years ago that have not sold their first thousand yet, are there any that you think deserve a second look that people should really be looking into if they get uh, you know the idea to try to support Third Window right now? You probably, I'd probably have to look at uh, what, you know, I do forget. <laughs> Mm. I mean, there are actually surprisingly films that um that surprisingly haven't done this or haven't broken even yet, like uh, the re-release of Fish Story on Blu-ray. I really expected that to do uh, a lot better, being the only Blu-ray release of the film in the world and region free and having loads of extras. Um, the DVD sold really well during its time, and the Blu-ray has not even broken even yet. So um, I, I, I do think that's a sort of film that's easy to recommend, whether you're into any sort of cinema, I think... Uh, it can be one that that everybody everybody likes. And my recent, most recent release of Summertime Machine Blues, I also think that's the type of film that you don't really have to be hardcore into Asian cinema or even cinema in general. And it's a film that would make you uh, enjoy it and, and feel good and, and, 
and it's it's a very good film with and a great release full of extras and the, the only release of the film outside of Japan. So I think uh, you know there there are lots of films, uh, yes, but but uh, you know whether they be my my label or somebody else's, you know, uh, yes, uh, please everyone, just I think yeah, watching films is 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 good. <laughs> And like I said, not only for supporting these groups, but it is literally archiving art. And some of the ways that we can do this is literally just to keep it in our minds, be able to make it a part of our modern history as well, and not just something that happened 40 years ago and was a blip in a history book, basically. Yeah, it's really important. Um, and you do learn this. I mean, being being a, a doing this for a while, for example, there was a director um, called Uchida Kenji who released his films like... Um, Key of Life, a stranger of, of, of mine, and uh, he made a few very good Japanese films about ten years ago. But none of those films were ever re really released, and he stopped making films for years. And he's sort of unknown. He's because his films never made it out there into people's hands. He's essentially sort of I don't know I don't I don't want to say died, but like in a sort of cultural sense, right. he doesn't exist. Uh, and for somebody who made all these great films. Back then, if it's it's important that they exist and not just like a, you know, of course it's easier to to um to rent a film and and maybe people don't have so much room in their houses and all that. Of course that you know we can't all have big houses. Even I, I live in Tokyo and I don't have so much room <laughs> anymore. But um, you know, I think uh, the concept of of having and and supporting physical anything uh, that, that keep art alive and keep um. Because if your computer breaks, or if a computer breaks, uh, you know, may, I think last year there was some big uh, situation with Intel or something like that. Something I remember that like data was wiped out for a long time. And if that right. happens and, and all these films are lost, then what are you going to do? So, um, you know, in one way or another, if you can keep something or another to pass on to your children uh, or, or pass on to to another next generation, it's it's important. That was very well said. Uh, that is why, you know, the, the restoration work being done on some of these older films is something that needs to be supported. The the fact that we are putting time and energy into, you know, for your company, primarily documenting the the hands that were actually on this film. I mean, you're going to these people's homes and l hearing from their mouth, their experience, their their time spent on them. And you guys have some great extras on everything that you've done. So again just thank you thank you thank you and yes uh, let's together try to keep find one <laughs> one person a day or, or you know one person every two days or three days you know i think it's you know it, i think it make, keeps everyone happy and keeps everything alive just you know or, or talking and, and meeting obviously it's not as easy to meet nowadays with covid but um even if it's just meeting on the internet like we are now uh, you know it's important i completely agree um, I'll uh, give you back your, your day then, Adam. Thank you so much for spending the time to come on here and discuss. I, I really hope people seek out Third Window Films. And the last thing I wanted to mention is you mentioned Terracotta Distribution. They are like one of your main arms of your storefront now, basically, correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, t Joey, the, the, the owner of Terracotta, is a friend of mine for 20 years. Uh, actually, I did a podcast yesterday. We do have the Third Window Films podcast, and we had him on as a guest, and it was a lot of reminiscing upon things that we've forgotten about 20 years uh, prior to. <laughs> but he used to also run his own distribution company, which he does less and less nowadays, but he acts as a, as a retailer. And right. thanks to him during COVID, when all the other people like Arrow doubled their commissions and really made it to a point where I didn't think I could continue anymore, to be honest, he right. has is using his house to, to, to ship out my Blu-rays and at a, at a, at taking a percentage that is, is nowhere near what Amazon and, and our and all the other big companies are asking. So I really, any anybody who uh, wants to buy any of my discs, I always send them to Terracotta. And I always price point them, they're lower than everywhere else because he takes a, um, a smaller percentage. So it's, it should be a win-win. But uh, if you can, it's it's really him just putting stuff into, um, into uh, packages uh, and posting them out himself. So it's uh, proper independent uh, all around. And there are frequently sales throughout the year. I mean, just a few months ago, you did the Takeshi Kitano. I think it was four Blu-rays for twenty pounds sale. That was yeah, the, shockingly the, low. Yeah, the thing is, the rights um, had expired, and I couldn't renew them, so I had all this stock right. left over. And if ever I do have stock left over or find stuff, sometimes I find stuff in a warehouse, like uh, of something that's been out of print for like years, it goes straight to him. 
and he sells it on his shop. So he always has the, um, yes, uh, the, the best way to uh, find anything that might be harder to find elsewhere. Terracotta is great. I've talked to Joey a couple times. He's a brilliant, brilliant dude. Um, again, thanks for your time, Adam. Everybody, please check out Third Window Films. Uh, they've got at least the Obi Obiashi set coming out the, the rest of the year. Is there anything else that you can tease or any other ideas coming up? I've been working on some Katsui Toishi films like Shark Skin Man and Peach of Girl and, uh, and Party 7, uh, which are quite uh, the sort of films that Tarantino really, really loved uh, and Interesting. inspired him to make uh, Kill Bill, in, in which he uh, hired the director of those films to work on Kill Bill with him. So I think they, they've, it's been 25 years since um, Shark Skin Man, and it's gonna, we're working on a remaster now. So um, hopefully it'll probably be next year. But there, there are some things like that that I've got on the, uh, the back burner. And um, yeah, hopefully things, things will, will move forward smoothly. Awesome. Thank you again, Adam. Have a good day. Hope uh, Tokyo treats you well. Thank you.